guys, welcome back to the channel. Uh, today we're at Crocodile Crossing at the Alligator Farm in St. Augustine. And I'm here with Scott Brown, who is the manager. And uh, Scott, how long have you working here? Going on 10 years. Uh, I initially came with the company that built the course in November of 2010. And the owner made me an offer I couldn't refuse, and I've been here ever since. Nice. This is the third course that I've built with the old company. So I'm responsible for the hiring, the firing, the uh, pretty much everything, design and uh, new construction. And going through the course, um, I'm just impressed the engineering. How you got to think ahead and how all the, uh, the junctions work and the lines. I, I don't know how you guys do it. Well, initially we had the old style system that relied on two carabiners. And the owner tasked me with finding something that is completely 100% foolproof. So it took a little over five years for me to find that. The system we have now, it is impossible to disconnect from the course. There aren't any moving parts. A lot of other systems out there claim they're foolproof. Uh, every year when I go to a conference for this stuff uh, and somebody comes out with a new system, I'll absolutely stay at their booth until I can make it fail. So none of them, <laughs> none of them really like me. <laughs> nice. But when I found this system, there's absolutely no way to make it fail. Yeah. Moving parts always fail. Moving parts wear out. There is nothing to wear out on this. Uh, the safety hook that keeps you connected to our system is hardened, surgical grade stainless steel. Carlos, be careful. A lot of the other systems are made with magnesium and aluminum. Okay. Magnesium and aluminum, when it runs on, across that steel wire rope, it's like yeah. running a two by four on a soft wall. So yeah. it makes it easier for us to sleep at night knowing that there's no way anybody can fall. And according to guidelines for uh, the associations that govern this stuff, we're not even required to watch the guests on the course anymore because there's no way to disconnect. That's great. All right, so we're about to make the turn. Number 17 is where it goes over to the Nile side, which is where what we did not do last time. Last time we went to the other side, the blue. Uh, we're gonna go red to the right. How you guys doing? <laughs> now what you don't want to do is hang out to the side to shoot video. You don't want to do that. Okay. I'm, not, I'm, I'm attached. So dangerous. You're dangerous. <laughs> I'm gonna guess pigs? All right, here comes nothing. It's a big one. Whoa. But like right here, I have to go that way. Sure? But there's another way on the other side. Yeah, there's multiple little... I see that. So when you get to these T junctions or cross junction, you gotta take this and flip it up so the plate can go through the slot. And then you get your safety line onto the next one. Hi, how you doing there, Haley? I'm great. Yeah. How you wanna show uh, everybody how you do this? So you attach the. What'd you do, Haley? You attach this thing onto the thing. The thing, okay. And then you put this thing on top, oh my God. right here. Uh huh. And then you hold down and you sit. Uh huh. And then you go. Bye. Bye. Take this guy off. Clip it on. Put that on there. Your back hand is a break. And you push down to slow down. And you sit down and then you just kind of yeah. 
This would be a crocodile. He's pointy. The pointy nose, the color patches on the side. Well, that's a croc over there as well. And then this, I'm pretty sure is an alligator, mostly because of the girth of it and then the nose looks rounded. It is kind of hard to tell from this angle though. I like this Nile area, the very cool Egyptian theme they have going on. Oh, and there's fish in the pond. I bet they're a nice little snack. Oh, look at that. So you gotta go across the ladder, 20 feet in the air, and it's slanted to one side. Good luck. How'd you get from here to over there? Uh huh. And then I just go, oh, look at that. And I go under it. Yeah. Okay. Apparently there's a red ruffed lemur around here, according to that sign. And this one is definitely a challenge. It's, uh... oh, these are slanted. Maybe like 25 feet up, I think. Not too bad. All right. Galacopos tortoises. You gotta try it, it's a great time. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I see them trying it, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got the whole course on video if you go on YouTube under Dad Ventures, uh -huh. that's the channel, and you're gonna see the whole thing. So right. you can at least experience it without having to get up here. That's it. <laughs> All right. Appreciate it. Okay, this looks like something from American Gladiator or, or uh, what are the, what's a more modern one of those things? American Ninja, Ninja Warrior, I don't know, one of those things. Got him old. That tortoise is watching you, Haley, look at him. He's just staring at you. He's dreaming of one day when he can go up here. He likes you, Haley, he's still looking at you. Hey, tortoise bro. Oh. Hey, buddy. Hi. So you gotta walk across a single line all the way across. That's so far. With a weird net. That's so far. Why did they make it like this? I, I don't know. Every netted thing they have, I don't like. This one's so scary. There's a cactus right there. Right. Don't fall on the cactus then. I don't have to tell you. I believe in you? It loves you. See, don't you feel safe? You're like cradled in safety. I mean, if you slip, you ain't going nowhere. Yeah! Good job! You got this, honey. Oh, you're just walking on the net. You don't even care. Yeah, you're supposed to walk on the line. I want to trust the net for your footing. Now look at your speed across. All right, this one, not as excited about this. This is a little treacherous. Plus, I'm tall, so these things are like right at my hips. Now a tip for you that I learned from last time, when you're gripping the line, I like to just take the tops of my fingers, oh geez, oh geez, I'm gonna fall off, and uh, curl them over, because when I used just my, my thumb and gripped it, I actually had a really sore hand the next day. It's better if I just knew that, that, that that's not smart. See this macaw down here? Oh yeah, I saw that. Pretty. If I look down here, don't fall. There is a really cool macaw. What up, buddy? Yeah, so that thing down there is definitely my least favorite obstacle. Not cool. 
like a roach cherry at the bottom. What do you think, Haley? I still want the quickest, though. So. You did go the quickest. <clears throat> These are huge old magnolia trees. They must smell great when they're blooming. Oh no! I gotta go like this now. This is kind of more fun! I was more distracted by all the alligators. You gotta try it! It's awesome! Well, all tortoises are turtles, but not all turtles are tortoises. It's like thumbs and fingers. <laughs> They're so cute. Oh, I gotta come out the water. Ah. Yeah, there's the entrance. Do it. Okay, bye. bye. Oh man. We go up. You got to say it with me. Those are big alligators. Wow. All right, zipline tip. This is supposed to go behind this. You don't want to have it here. That's not safe. So if this happens, you just pop this off, slide this back, pop this back on. And you're good to go. Down here we have Indian Gario. This is probably the most unique and most recognizable species because of that long pointed snout. Beautiful animal. I believe their main diet is fish. And I think this group just had babies. They should do like a dueling dragons kind of thing where you zip line across each other. You know, like they go different ways and you try to kick each other. No. Supposed to walk across this one. But that tightrope stuff is crazy. Okay, that actually worked really well. I wear this one. This is the one we went across, and there was a couple of crocs there. Be careful, they're on that side. Huh? They're on that side. Oh, look at him over there. It's a great place to take kids. They just see these animals up close and it's amazing. They learn so much while they're here. And this one was great because you have these slippery diagonal logs that are round. And they go every other way. They're usually beneath you certain depth, but they're, they're over there today. Oh my goodness. This is uh, stop 2342. You know, nature uh, happens like that sometimes. That guy ate that guy. Now 
we were out there, um, I caught it on video. We did have, uh, we saw an incident where a, a larger alligator happened to be a, a smaller one. And you know, it does happen in nature. So you're kind of explaining how that happens. And... Well, it's, uh, you're always gonna have animals challenge each other for either a spot in the sun or territory. Uh, so a lot of times it's a real estate dispute. Sometimes if a natural prey item falls into an enclosure and a smaller animal grabs that prey item, at the same time a bigger alligator is trying to grab it uh it's small fish eating minnow big fish eating small fish so it's just a chain of events that once they are in feeding mode uh it's not something that you can turn off right away and when that goes on uh, a lot of times other larger animals also join in and before anything can be done about it they're already dismantling that smaller alligator is this similar to like a feeding frenzy that you see with sharks? Yes and no. Okay. Uh, sharks, they're usually only after one item that's there that is that is injured and they're all just destroying it. Okay. This happens when something falls in, small animal eats it. The bigger animal is not necessarily trying to eat the small animal okay. right away. He's trying to get that prey item. Unfortunately, the smaller animal's already got a hold of it. So he gets the smaller guy's head in his mouth. And then, like I said, it's, you can't just turn that feeding response off at that, uh, that point. They're already wound up, and they're just going to keep going. Okay. I guess the uh, last question is, we're coming into the winter, so are you guys open for the entire winter? And how would you encourage people to come out? We're, we're open year-round. Uh, okay. Unfortunately, this year, as everybody knows, 2020 has been insane. Um, the only thing we'll shut down for, obviously, was COVID. If we feel we're going to be impacted by a hurricane or tropical storm and we're going to get winds that are too high, then and then the whole park's done. Uh, other than that, we're open all the time. The only thing we shut the course down on normal days for, if we get lightning within 10 miles, we're done. It's got to be at least 20 miles away and moving away before I'll let anybody back up there. Okay. If we've had a lot of rain and the ground's saturated, I'm even more uh, skeptical about letting them right back, let them up right, right away. A torrential downpour, you're not going to want to be up there. And once we get yeah. winds that are sustained over 20, uh, we're really leery because on the bigger course, you're near a lot of palm trees that do a lot of swaying. Yep. And you don't want that swaying in your face when you're on the long dip. So those obviously shut us down. The big thing is watch the weather a couple days before. Give us a call, uh, make a reservation. The online reservation system is shut down right now. It's completely being rebuilt, so please be patient. Just come dressed comfortable. You don't want to come in long jeans, long black t-shirt when it's hot out or you're going to burn up. Actually, in wintertime and fall and early spring, I encourage more people to do it than normal. Uh, it's just nicer outside. Hopefully, between now and next year at this time, I get to do the expansion that I was wanting to do. Oh, nice. This year, COVID kind of pulled the rug out from underneath of us. So there will be, whether or not it's this year coming up or not, but it is guaranteed it is going to happen. Nice. Where the course is split, uh -huh. the platform before that, we're going to build another big tower, and instead of going out off property to the little cargo net and going up to another platform, you're going to go from there all the way to Oasis of the Nile. Okay. So it'll be two side-by-side -side racing zips, like oh, nice. roughly 330 feet long, so they'll be longer than the, the longest one we have now, uh, and it'll, you'll be able to go side-by-side, -side, and then we'll eliminate the cargo net. Not too many people are a fan of that anyway, because it's yeah. kind of hard. Sure, Julian and I did not like it at all. <laughs> yeah, it is. And, and for old people like me, it's a little rough, especially if you got bad knees. But uh, we're going to eliminate that and that two long zips, which everybody loves the zip lines. Slowly but surely, we're trying to replace a lot of the ropes course elements with more zips. Uh, but we still do also have the climbing tower. For those that want to work hard, the rope climb on the front has replaced the free falls. The free falls are gone. Okay. Uh, we've eliminated them. A lot of people were afraid of them. We've just made it all all fine. So it's one price. You can stay on them all day if you want them. All right, Scott. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. It's been yes, a great sir. time. And uh, come out to Crocodile Crossing. It's a blast. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so earlier this week, I was lucky enough to get an interview with Jen Anderson, one of the head zookeepers at the alligator farm, who specializes in conservation. Let's take a look at that right now. I'm saying it's Jen Anderson, right? Perhaps Jen? Yes, it is. 
All right, great. Uh, so is it true that the St. Augustine Alligator Farm is one of the few locations in the world that actually has every species of crocodilian? So we were originally, we were the only place in the world to have all 24 described crocodilians in the world. I think second had maybe, has maybe like 21, but now a few other species of crocodilians have now been scientifically described. So there's now 27 species. So we oh, now wow. have the most species of crocodilians in the world. So which one out of all the species is the most endangered? The Chinese alligator is thought to be one of the most, if not the most endangered species, but a few others have a run for the money. So Cuban crocodiles are definitely up there. They're okay. an island species. So they already have that going against them, but they also naturally hybridize with the far more abundant American crocodile in the wild. So that's kind of like two strikes for them. Okay. And so like, what's the, um, I guess for the Chinese alligator, uh, like, what's the main reason that, that they're endangered so much? The Chinese alligators did not adjust well to uh, rice agriculture fields. So okay. they prefer a different type of habitat. And also all the rodent poison that was put down in those rice fields didn't bode well for the Chinese alligators. So a lot of that's been oh, wow. corrected and adjusted. Um, and they are breeding in the wild again. And they have a very prolific captive breeding down there, but not okay. the wild populations. So. Okay. And, you know, speaking of, of breeding and, and conservation, I'm assuming that there's a, a strong breeding program there at the alligator farm. Is that correct? We do. And we're lucky that they lay eggs. It makes it a lot easier to manage. So what we're going to hatch out, what we're not. And crocodilians are, their egg, their, the babies hatch out depending on the temperature their eggs are incubated at. So okay. if we want to hatch out some females, we can actually put the eggs in, into artificial in incubation to hatch out a bunch of females, whatever's needed for the population population or the species as a whole. So it's super handy. So we typically hatch out every year is seven species of crocodilians, but some years we may have in our collection plan, we're only gonna focus on these few species. Okay, so the temperature actually determines the sex? Yeah, usually about halfway through incubation. Yeah. Oh, that is, that's crazy. Yeah, so it's super <laughs> handy. But because it's so, the environment is so warm, warm temperatures or hot temperatures tend to produce females. Okay. So if you're leaving eggs out in the wild, like with alligators here in Florida, the majority of them are gonna hatch out as female. So it depends on what you're looking for for the population. Okay, and the ones that you hatch there, um, I'm, I'm, do they go to other zoos and facilities or do you actually keep them all there? Well, we do both. So since we're a member of the AZA, the, Associ the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, we actually work very closely with over 300 other accredited facilities. We okay. all share all of our animals. We don't spend money back and forth. It's all uh, donations back and forth and so that way and we share the genetics. It's one giant gene pool instead of wow. just what we have here. It makes it a lot easier, but we still have limited space, even though we have over 300 facilities we work with or could feasibly work with. Okay. So we, we do closely monitor what we hatch out because we need to think about space, what is needed other places, what can we possibly send back to regions in the wild, and what do we have room to hatch out and house here for five, to 50 years. So we have to think okay. about all of that. Yeah. Okay, that's actually what I was gonna ask was outside of the 300 facilities, if any of these go back into the wild and it sounds like some of them do. We've done it with Chinese alligators and we've been trying to do it with Siamese crocodiles for the past few years, but dealing with other countries sometimes can, and all the paperwork and just mm -hmm. political changes of governments, it, it makes things like that a little difficult. Okay. It doesn't mean we don't want to try. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Now, uh, here in Florida, um, you know, there are, I guess, driving through, like, say, um, the Ponte Vedra area, I've seen, you know, smaller alligators, you know, that have been hit by cars on the side of the road, you know, interactions with humans that they do get injured, whether it's by a boat or whatever. Do people ever actually bring injured animals to uh, your facility for help? Um, well, we get calls daily about injured and orphan wildlife. On occasion, I do accept them, but we do not have a rehab license here. We cannot do wildlife okay. rehabilitation. So mostly I just mention where they can take it. Sometimes we go help someone catch an animal and then they take it to the rehabber. Sometimes they just drop them off here and then I take them to the rehabber later in the day. Injuries do happen, all these animals together. So uh, I think during one of the um, the, the shows in the, the main area when you walk in, uh, they were saying that when alligators get injured, they have a special property where they can heal really quickly by itself. So I guess what 
does that happen a lot? And what do you guys do if they happen to injure each other? Well, we do have almost 1,000 animals here. And yes, the majority of them are crocodilians, about 750, but we have lots of turtles and tortoises and a really dynamic bird collection and some smaller mammals and lemurs and primates and things like that. And so our vets are actually the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine, the zoo med department. Oh, okay. And we've been using them for decades and decades, way before my time, and they're phenomenal. So they actually come out here a couple of times a month just for kind of basic care, annual exams, any vaccinations that we need to do. If we have something bigger that needs to be done, we just drive over to UF where we have top of the line medical equipment and staff to do what needs to be done. Very so, cool. but yeah, alligators do have antimicrobial properties in their blood, which it's kind of like they just have this built-in disinfectant and it does help them heal pretty quickly for just your normal daily scrapes and such. And then speaking of, of your time, you mentioned you know, things there before your time. So how long have you worked in this field and how long have you been there? I've worked in the zoo field for just over 20 years, actually. Okay. Um, most of my time has actually been here, but I've been at three AZA accredited zoos and one aquarium. Cool, all right. Yeah. And I guess what's your favorite part of, of your job and conservation in general? My favorite part of the job is that every day is different. At the same time, that's also my least favorite part of the <laughs> job. Because sometimes I just wanna just come in and know what's gonna happen during the day. I am really, I really moved a lot of, my position is kind of rolled into conservation and research. And so I love the reproductive aspect. I love making connections with field conservation projects and working with them and trying to do more and more. Our plan was to do even more this year, but mm -hmm. you know, things kind of change and you yeah. can't travel and you can't do anything like that. So it's been a little bit of a trickier year. Uh, and then work, working with researchers, a lot of researchers, scientific researchers come here to our zoo because they don't have the funding to go study I don't know, we'll say cloacal gland secretions of crocodilians and go to every country around the world and to mm -hmm. catch, catch wild animals to get this this thing. They can come here, one-stop shop, support their project and help them with that to really better the future of these animals and the knowledge base for them. Alligator. Final surprise question. Do you have a favorite animal there at the alligator farm? See, we're not supposed to pick <laughs> favorites. I know. <laughs> we do. But my favorite animal is always the one that is behaving or doing what I want it to be doing next. <laughs> so today, golden conures actually win, a parent species. Okay. So they have three babies that are growing and adorable, and it's the first time we've ever had golden conure babies here in the history oh, of the nice. year since we've had golden conures. So very proud of them, and they're doing a magnificent job as first time parents. And uh, we just had our hands on the chicks this morning, so that's fresh in my brain. Nice. Yeah. And is there anything else you wanted to add before we uh, close up? I guess the one thing that I want to just mention to your viewers is if you haven't ever been to the St. Augustine Alligator Farm Zoologic Park, please make an effort to come visit. We are not an alligator farm. Actually, in the history of the alligator farm since 1983, we have never, ever farmed alligators. It's just mm -hmm. this really old name that we still have. Um, and that's what we're well world renowned for. So we still keep it. But we are an accredited zoo for over 30 years now. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we just provide the highest standards of animal care and welfare we possibly can. And of course, we keep pushing that that boundary every single day and try to make things as best as we can for these guys now and into the future. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate this. I know you have a busy schedule today. So, um, but thank you. And uh, I, I appreciate it. All right, take care. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye. We had a great time today at Crocodile Crossing, St. Augustine, Florida, Alligator Farm. Until next time, keep having adventures.